So um, I'm going to be posting all the recordings. No worries, I'm a little bit behind on that, but it's going to be on post. But we're going to talk about uh, hemostasis. We're going to generally review the new responses and new pathologies. It's not a lot, a lot of like, and we're going to touch upon lymphatics, but we're not actually going to put anything on the board in terms of so lymphatics is very small. I can tell you up front that your next exam, which is next week, most of the material, I would say 55-60% is immunity. 30% whole heart, blood. 10% tops, if not less than that, lymphatics. Because it's so inconsequential, it seems to me. So let's start um, with actually the concept of hemostasis. So hemostasis is a um, response to a vessel injury, okay? The vessel gets broken. So there are three main parts the hemostatic response. The first part of hemostatic response, the formation of, <coughs> sorry, it's a vascular response. Um, I, when I can draw, I will draw. In this case, my drawing will take a lot of time and it will be way worse than anything that you can find in the option. So vascular spasm, vessel is damaged, it constricts right away. Reduce the blood flow to the damage. Next story, uh, it's going to be platelet activation. We're going to call it platelet flood because platelet activation is the process. So what, how is platelet flood formed? So, here's the idea. Imagine that you have a damaged blood vessel. So, endothelium, right, is damaged. That immediately leads to the exposure of such molecules as preselected. selected factor integrins, they are exposed. This part? Surface mold. Basically, like, I'm not going to ask, like, is p selectin a part of a D, or is alpha-3, beta-2 integrin a part of a D? What I want you to process is that when endothelium is damaged, there are molecules sticking out. They start to stick out. And these molecules that are exposed into the blood, they actually activate platelets. Does that make sense? So think of it as an alarm. Does that make sense? Like a smoke detector that sets off like when it beeps, you know something is going wrong, okay? When it beeps, platelets get activated. Like, you calling 911. Not only this, damage to endothelium a little leads to release of molecule called Tuvoxane A. And what does Tuvoxane A do? Activates platelets. Okay, we're good. And to kind of add a, a cherry on top of that, too. when platelet is activated, they activate themselves. Well, not themselves, but other things. Does that make sense to you? So, in a way, it does look like. Uh, a 911 response, 
you know, uh, a, a person like, okay, I, I'm, I'm told, hey, folks, there is a fire, okay? So I come to you and say, there is a fire. I get activated and I activate all of you. It being, yes, it's a domino effect. It's the process that goes with the positive. It's, it's a positive feedback. They just keep underrated. Now, the question is, of course, why, if it's a positive feedback, why our blood does not all, like, why our platelets do not clot all together every time we get a vessel injury? There's really a good answer. Because if you have undamaged endothelial, undamaged endothelial, and you do, most of your endothelium is fine. It constantly produces postocytes and nitroposite. Okay. These two molecules, they have an inhibitory effect on flavor activation. That's a nice thing. Does that make sense? So, the damaged in the field, that's where platelet blood is for. Non-damaged. Non-damaged endothelium produces inhibitors that prevent platelets from sticking together. Does that make sense? <clears throat> Are we clear? Now, look at this. What people take, people who are at high risk of strokes or high risk of thrombosis, they, what is the cheapest prophylactic drug? What people take to prevent myocardial infection? It's fine because you're, if in your family it's not an issue, you probably will not know aspirin. Aspirin is anticoagulant. You know what it does? It inhibits the formation of thrombosome. Just, just so you know, okay, does that make sense? So aspirin inhibits formation of thromboxane A and reduces flavor activation. It doesn't abolish it completely because it's not one that, but it reduces it dramatically. Okay, we're good so far? All right. So the third mechanism of hemostasis is Coagulation. Now, in coagulation, there are two specific pathways the intrinsic and the extrinsic pathway. And I want again to highlight what is the difference between them. So intrinsic pathway means that it's inside. Okay. So intrinsic pathway is confined to the it's stimulated by the damage within the vessel. Okay. So what can it be? Look at this. Platelets. Are they inside the vessel? Yes, they are. When they are activated, it's not normal. Is it considered to be a damage within the vessel? Yes. Okay. Endothelial cells get inflamed. Is that a damage within the vessel? Yes. A vessel as a pipe remains more or less intact. Everything is confined. Extrinsic pathway is when damage extends the tissue. Am I clear? So in this case, vessel as a pump is broken. All right? So what starts the cascade? 
No, you have an absolutely gorgeous, unfortunately overcomplicated picture, flowchart of coagulation testing in the electrolytes. What I want you to know, basic sequence of events, for instance, for an uh, intrinsic factor, we have factor 12 that activates factor 11, as Katie mentioned, it's a domino. Factor 12 activates factor 11, factor 11 activates factor 9, factor 9 with the help of factor 8 from a different pathway uh, activates factor 10, and that's it. And then, now look, there are quite a few steps, look, 12, 11, 9, 8, and then 10. That's all intrinsic factor. Extrinsic factor. <clears throat> Tissue factor, so called tissue factor, activates factor seven and factor eight. And they come to, to a certain conclusion. So, what I'm trying to say in kind of a uh, not great manner, I don't think I did a good job here. I actually could have said it much shorter. Intrinsic factor is small. And it's music which makes perfect sense. If you have a damage to the tissue, if you have a damage to the tissue, you don't want things to proceed much faster. This damage is more expensive. Uh, truth be told, in a majority of cases, in a real situation when there is a, a damage to the vessel, both parties are injured. Platelets will play a major role in initiating intrinsic factor, then tissue damage will start to change. The key story here is that both factors, they essentially converge on the same outcome, which is all. Both hormones activate. So, if you would look at uh, electrical notes, eventually you don't need to do it now, even if you have them with you. <clears throat> there is a massive complex formed by coagulation factor and calcium, spotted in serum, coagulation factor 5. They all come together, okay? and form what's called conformed and activated. A really quintessential idea that I want you to process is that both intrinsic and extrinsic pathways come to the same conclusion. Does that make sense? That's key. What's the function of perform and activated? Well, it activates the thrombin, converting raw thrombin into thrombin. And what is the function of thrombin? Thrombin converts the green engine into fiber. Sure, yeah. Look, you gave a great analogy, which is a domino effect. When you for when when pathways eventually form the thrombin activator, it's an enzyme. This enzyme converts raw thrombin into thrombin, active thrombin. Thrombin, being yet another enzyme, converts a protein, soluble protein called fibrinogen into insoluble protein called fibrin. Make sense so far? And fibrin forms this real long um, well, fibers. And fiber is what reinforces the platelet flow. Because otherwise, it's like it's a mortar to bricks. You clear? So you probably have heard it is useful in hemophilia. So genetic, it's uh, X linked 
recessive condition. So women are carriers and men, let's say, become affiliate. This is bad. It's not to be bad. It become famous because of you know, royal family and stuff. In hemophilia, factor 10, which is an essential part of the formula activator, it is a part. Okay, and this whole, by the way, this part here is called a common part. You can actually Google, it's pretty cool. Google, uh, if you Google hemophilia in the royal families in Europe, you can see how uh, there was a founder. So some unlucky family, Russian and German royal family, they had hemophilia gene running in the family. And lucky family, like I think Swedish and uh, Spanish and British actually. They just, so it happened that people, the gene wasn't passed. And since it's kind of eventually in the early 20th century, they stopped like breeding exclusively with each other. The families got more isolated. You can see how the gene runs in Russian and German, but not in Spanish and British and Swedish. That's how, okay, that makes sense. Hybrid, all things together. Those, look. This and this are two separate things. They, so this platelet activation triggers intrinsic pumping, which results in a fibrin formation, and fibrin enforces platelet plug to make it more robust. Does that make sense? Um, now, let's say we have a damage to uh, damage to the vessel in order to prevent bleeding, platelet get activated, platelet plug is formed, it's enforced by enforced by uh, fiber, it's all good. Next step, obviously, the wound should heal, it heals, uh, smooth muscle grows back, the, the vessel and the helium grows back, everything is fixed, but we still have a clot, right? A clot formed by platelets. Right. How do you let go? Why we do not the entire blood? Why doesn't it clot in its entirety every time we cut a finger? Because technically speaking, it's the positive feedback, right? Like a lot of chondin, a lot of fibrin, platelets get activated. We already learned that endothelium releases prostacyclins and nitric oxide, which reduces platelet activation. So, a few other things that control blood. One, blood flow. It's hard to work when you're being washed all the time. Washed all the time. Sense, right? Second, that's absolutely spectacular. Trombin here. It's, it's the protein in the circulation. Thrombin binds to the soluble fiber. And when, look, when thrombin binds to fibrin, what does that mean? It means you have less and less. The more fibrin you have, the less thrombin you have, because fibrin will take it out. Does that make sense? So that's another mechanism. There are certain proteins like anti-thrombin that are produced that control that takes to the children. It's basically a game of tug of war. Does that make sense? There are proteins that keep trombin in check. Uh, there are some anticoagulants like heparin, yeah, that prevents um, clotting. Um, oh, yeah. So let's say you keep this thing in check. This is why the entire blood doesn't clot in a second. How do you get rid of the clot? And everything is healed and fixed. What do you do next? There is an enzyme for tissue that's going to activate the tissue.
Although I often make fun of scientists for how they make it, this time I'm not going to make fun because it's a it's a really good name. It's found in tissue, and what it does, it activates plasminogen. Does that make sense? So the cursor molecule called plasminogen gets activated into plasma. And plasmin destroys fiber. Okay? Doesn't make sense. The plasmin, by destroying fiber, uh, essentially uh, allows breaking blood to completely dissolve it. Am I clear? Good. Just trying to think of my reasons. Now, I want a blank. Huh. One more thing. I encountered that mistake before, and I just want to clarify. Often students mix two concepts being activated and being converted to. So, if you will look into the lecture notes and you will see the steps of intrinsic factor, factor 12 does not become factor 1. Michael, factor 12 activates factor 1. And factor 11 activates factor 9. They still exist, they separate molecules, separate entities. Now, the thrombin activator doesn't become thrombin. It activates for thrombin, so it will be thrombin. Thrombin does not become fiber. Thrombin activates fibrinogen, which becomes fiber. Am I clear? Good. Um, uh, that's going to lead to hemostasis. This is a big area of research because of uh, cardiovascular disease. So, like, if you look at in the notes, I list some of the medications that target coding, um, like warfarin and heparin and aspirin and bigotran. Um, the latest ones, uh, the thrombin inhibitors, they are super efficient. Like the bigotran. You see them advertised all the time. Basically, people are like, well, they were doing middle aged papers. Are we clear? Good. Um, so, what is the question? Okay. If you want to take a picture, take a picture because I'm going to get rid of this pretty soon. Got it? Awesome. It basically concludes our conversation about um, blood. And today we're going to discuss basic mechanisms of the innate and adaptive immunity. We're going to start with the innate. You know a lot about the responses already. Um, now, just just let you know. Usually, so we discuss immunity here in AP two, and I also discuss immunity in micro. The part that we do in micro is much more detailed. So this is a little bit of a short version. So first, the mechanism of innate immunity. We can broadly define as inflammation. Now, what does that mean? Remember um, our discussion last week when I was drawing um, white blood cells uh, crossing the wall of the blood vessel. Remember that story? That's it. 
That's it. We're not talking about it. We talked about it done. All right? So that's information. Second mechanism. And when I say mechanisms, it's not like really, it's more of a response style. What do our immune system can do? Second thing, phagocytosis. Again, this is something that I'm not going to draw because I suck at drawing. And the steps are pretty simple. We have a cell, okay, that extends to the podia, surrounds whatever is supposed to be eaten as phagocytosis. To eat. And it consumes, let's say it's a uh, bacteria, okay? So your phagocyte will consume bacteria, uh, will mix bacteria with chemicals like acid and hydrogen peroxide and some proteolytic enzymes. It will destroy bacteria to pieces and so The only thing that I want to highlight in phagocyte is just like cell types will do it. Anything else? And mother. Okay. And things to remember neutrophils, one and done. They phagocytose and die. And macrophages can do it with all over and over and over. Okay. Now, third mechanism of the name. I'm going to stick it actually here. Complex. Now, complement is an interesting mechanism. It's very tension type of response. It's a, a set of proteins found in plasma in the blood. Complement isn't associated with a cell. It's not inside of the cell. It isn't really produced by a specific cell in response to it, it's found in the blood. Am I correct? Look, this is cellular response. Make sense? In inflammation, you have cytokines that are produced by cells, and they attract cells. Complement functions entirely as coordinating the response. Cells are not involved. Got it? You will see what I mean when I say cells are not involved. The complement has to be activated, and there are three pathways for the complement activation. First is classic pathway. So, classic pathway of complement activation is so, in this case, this. Look, your analogy, Katie, your analogy of domino effect applies to so many things here. This is one of them. So what you have, you have antibody. On the pathogen surface. Okay. These antibodies on the pathogen surface can activate complement. And then you're gonna have your domino chips falling down. Are we clear? Second pathway is called lectin pathway. So lectin, one of the elements, like one of the molecules in a complement response binds to the mannose, it's a sugar, on the surface of the pathogen. And mannose will binding to lectin activates complement. Does that make sense to you? Let me finish with the third one and I'll explain. Because I I I I have some not very politically correct analogy, but we'll go over it anyway. Alternative pathway. Okay. Uh, 
Thank you, Alex, for the on the surface. Um, so, imagine, imagine, imagine that the path is a pyramid. Okay. So, you know how in departments there is a Floating, floating, floating items have this, I don't know what to call them, the plastic thingies that they have to remove the check out. If you will try to remove it, it will splash the ink all over the item. So think of it as an activation. So if you see a person who walks out of the store wearing an item with a splash on it, that's antibody. You say, aha, uh -huh, that person just stole this thing. Okay? So these antibodies activate complement, activate your response to the act of stealing. Does that make sense? Now, when I said it's politically correct, as you can see that my knowledge of criminal law comes mostly from the movies and TV shows. So imagine you see someone with the tattoos and tattoos and you realize oh those are like prison time or something like that or they are done in some really terrible shady gang so this is the gang member we need to arrest okay that makes sense that's kind of what i'm trying to provide an analogy there is something on the package whether it's antibodies that your immune system or mannose, sugar, that is commonly found on the package, or some other random molecule. All of these surface markers can activate company. Good? Perfect. Why do we do <clears throat> Again, uh, immunologists, people that teach immunology, usually say that complement is the, the biggest nightmare of any immunologist. There are like a couple dozen different proteins, all have different names, which makes no sense, like B or C7 or C1Q. So like you can't reasonably process this. Is that nice? So we're not we're not talking about it. again each part is dominant. Classic activates one thing that, that one thing activates another, and oh, it's also the point is all three pockets converge on the same conclusion, which is a coding on C3B. It's converted. And that is a starter for actual responses. So what can happen as the result of complement application? First, that's really weird. It stimulates inflammation. Okay, we good? Second, um, it causes formation of memory of complex MAC. Um, sounds super um, multi complicated it's not. Membrane attack complex is a whole bunch of complement proteins. Okay. Huh? Attack, yeah. A T A A T T A C K. That's kind of it's kind of hard for me. Yeah, but they what they attack, they attack membrane by putting a hole in it. Uh, so a bunch of proteins form a pore that pierces through the membrane. The membrane is integrity of the membrane is disrupted like this, there's gonna be like roll ions back and forth on the cheat share of the membrane. So that. Declared? That's NAC. And finally, the third response that I wanted to address 
like two step response optimization. I'll explain what it is, which leads to the stimulation of adversaries. Now let's answer first what is optimization? Um, I'll explain what it actually is and then give you an analogy. So, um, this covert base typically <clears throat> activates a set of proteins in complex. These proteins bind to the surface of the pathogen and make it more attractive to the spagocytes. Now, pathogens, different pathogens, can try to avoid being eaten. Does that make sense? Optimization <clears throat> surrounding the pathogen with proteins make those pathogens more, <clears throat> how to say, uh, noticeable for phagocytes. I usually compare it to a bland food. You have something really, really bland, which you don't want to eat. You add some spices to it, and that's your spice, and it suddenly becomes a fun. Make sense? <clears throat> As we will see, complement is not the only thing that can absolutely. So far, we're good. Interference. Okay, now, what is an interference response in a nutshell? There is a cell, human cell, and the cell gets infected. Okay. So that's an infection. So, Starts to produce interference. Okay. Interference travel to another cell and since interference are large water soluble proteins, they have to bind to the receptor on the surface of the cell. Sounds familiar. Anyway. Large water soluble protein that cannot cross the membrane and can only bind to the receptor on the cell, just like an endocrine system water soluble <clears throat> Does that make sense? So they will bind to that cell, and that binding will lead to, we're going to call it an environment for the response. Good. So, <clears throat> you think that I want to have that one first. You gotta have an infection. Inside the cell, outside of the cell, it's not done. You need an infection. Once you get an infection, an interference up to genes. Look, interference don't do shit to a pathogen. They don't kill it, they don't lice it, they don't tag it, nothing. What they do, they are warning signs. They are the smoke alarm. Does that make sense? They warn other cells. Hey, we've got a problem. Mount up a response. Does that make sense? Now, look, interference can act on the same cell. And for instance, send it in apoptosis. Fine. Okay? It's called autocrine signal. They can act on adjacent cells, in pericrine signal. They can get in the blood and travel through the body, warning cells all over the place. That's endocrine signal. The point is, they warn other cells. Does that make sense to you? And this is why you may have heard, you know, people proposing interferon as the treatment for coronavirus. 
Yeah. I was studying computer responses and viruses, not coronavirus. You do interferon before the infection, works marvelous. Your body, well, I did it in the model only, but if you will do like a massive shadow interferon, knowing that you're going to get infected with the virus like 24 hours later, perfect. You have now. When you're already infected, there is no point. It's too late. Infection is already going, you like all being infected. Does that make sense? So, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, oh, you mean do interference have side effects? Oh, yeah. Like one administration, though, you're probably not going to feel any things to track that. But interference is a useless treatment for infections that we don't really have a treatment for, like yellow fever or dengue. Um, it, they used to be uh, useful for hepatitis C treatment. They have terrible side effects, like digestive problems. The immune system isn't like starts functioning weird. Uh, one of the big side effects of interference, mental problems, depression, serious like suicidal depression. So no, they are not, they're not something that uh, we could go and nonchalantly ask for a prescription. It's not. Really. So you can basically, what I'm saying, we can't produce interference so all Americans just start popping pills as a prophylaxis. It's, it's not. For this, it's not. Be clear. Good. Okay, <clears throat> so those are mechanisms of native immunity. And I want, since we're going to be transitioning into adaptive immunity, I want to highlight several features of the main compared to the other. So look at this mechanism. Not a single time I mentioned that, say, it works against this virus, but not that virus. Not that bacteria, but not that. But those mechanisms, those responses, they are uh, very general and rather non specific. Right? So you can have phagocytic responses against bacteria as a whole, uh, complement responses against viruses as a whole. So they Non-specific, which usually non-specific responses are much less effective. Am I clear? Two, they're rapid, which is good. It's good. Okay? But they're usually pretty local. So an easy example of a local um, native immune response, uh, sore throat. You know, like you look in, in the throat and there's like white exudate. That might accident, that neutrophils. Or a wound infection, the pus, that neutrophils. Local response, not super systemic. So those are the differences between innate and adaptive. Innate is local, adaptive is systemic. Innate is fast, adaptive is slow. It takes like a couple of weeks. weeks. Innate non specific, adaptive is designed. Respond to a particular pathogen. So that vaccine, ever heard by the way? Pfizer announced that the vaccine is 90% effective, which is stuff. I mean, it's not like a the, 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 the study is not completely finished, but it's very, very good preliminary data. Looks good. Okay, so let's go. Um, and much more efficient. Adaptive immunity is much more efficient. And when I say adaptive immunity targets particular pathogen, this vaccine, the coronavirus vaccine, it will protect us from coronavirus, not from any okay. um, Finally, it's not. Adaptive immunity 
forms immunological matter. This is why vaccines work. We produce a response to vaccination which protects us when we get exposed to that pathogen later on and on again. That makes sense. And we're going to discuss the immunological memory. So what is huh? immunological memory? So what is necessary? What is the keystone for adaptive immune determination? The keystone here is the concept of antigen. That makes sense. And what is that? Large and not So, for instance, <clears throat> when you receive hopefully one, when you receive blood transfusion. Not being important in the immune response because, like human on human, that comes in from another person isn't important to me. It's you, you human, and they human. If you would receive albumin from a mouse or from a rabbit, that's going to be important. Albumin is large and complex, exploited, so yeah, it works as an animal. That makes sense. Now, a hormone. Is it complex? It can be like a thyroid or small mole. Is it complex? It can be, but it's not one. Does that make sense? Now, this plastic bottle is made of polyethylene. Polymer. Molecules in that polymer are enormous. And they are definitely important. But they're not complex. They really structurally simple, very simple. So, which makes polyethylene non object You cannot produce immune response to this. Does that make sense? Now, when we say foreign, we appreciate the foreign. Not like the entire molecule of antigen is recognized. It's so called hypogenic determinant, right? When When you meet someone who you don't know, like you have a date, you, know, you just buy something at Facebook Market and you need to recognize a person. Uh, you know, people don't describe the, them as, you know, I have a head, two arms, and two legs. Usually they would say, I'm going to be wearing a red jacket, you know, green pants, something like this. Right? Very specific mark. So there's very specific markers that your immune system recognizes on antigen determinants. Okay. Those are antigen determinants. And your immune system responds to this by, first of all, Producing very specific antibodies. Okay? Now, what is an antibody? I'm thinking about the proper order of how to explain this. Okay, let's start with uh, the structure of an antibody. Okay, so this is antibody, which consists of to heavy chains and two light chains. That makes sense. It does look like a form. So the handle of the forms, it's a form. Okay? Good so far? These chains are connected to each other, it doesn't matter. Not important. What's important to understand? This part of an antibody called FAB part. AB stands for antigen binding. This part of antibody 
is FC. FC stands for constant. So this constant right, this one, the handle, the handle, doesn't change much between different copyrights. Because this is what your cells are using to interact with antibodies. If that makes sense. They want like think of think of the antibody as a multi-tool. You know this uh, in Home Depot, uh, they sell this semi-professional tools, and you have like a, 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 a motor handle and some, some stuff inside, and you can turn it into a drill, you can turn it into a little saw, or, I don't know, screwdriver, stuff like that. You, you see what I'm saying? So that's your antibody. These parts, and there are two FAB fragments, so one and two, right? So these fragments, FAB, right, they are very variable. They change all the time. They different in different antibodies, so they can bind to different antigens. Does that make sense? FC fragment is pretty constant. I would clear this up. And your antibody repertoire, the the spectrum of recognition is pretty broad. So you can do different types of. So let's talk about what's the moral responsibility. And <clears throat> I'm going to leave antibodies here, okay? and I'm going to say a few words about the medium of the moral responsibility. It's going to get decent. So decent. They all white blood cells. You know, they originate in the body of the Okay? And B cells mature in the bone marrow as well. Does that make sense? It's like, you know, you are from Cleveland and you go to Cleveland State. And then they are dispatched into the body organs. So I'm going to pause it here. Now, imagine if you were that, right? That gentleman right over there. Benjamin. Okay, so. These B cells originate inside of the bone. They stay in the bones and mature. And then they leave the bone marrow and end up in the lymphoid organs such as skin and lymph nodes. Are we clear? What happens next? Now we're going to talk about the recognition of the um, antigen. By heat cells. So to do this, we're going to use new, new colors, right? And I'm not going to draw this classic antibody shape. In order to explain it better, I'm going to change the shape of it. Imagine that we have a pathogen. And this is an antigenic component. Shaped like this. And so that's anti. Good. And we have two populations, two flows of B cells. Blue flow and the green flow. Blue flow of the B cell receptor. It's like this. So it's a B cell. 
This is B cell 2 with a different B cell receptor. Based on this probe, which clone will bind to the antigen in between? Right? So, this process of selecting a clone with a specific B cell receptor. Selecting a clone with a B cell receptor is called clonal selection. We good? And what's going to happen to that B cell? And what is this B cell receptor? At this point, I'm going to use this one. B cell receptor is the antibody. That makes sense. Which anchored in the cell by the hand, by the FC fragment. Does that make sense? Do you understand? Just no? Okay, no, 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 it's fine. Look, I bought this material so many times, I kind of know when things make no sense. This is why, I, like, do you get so? You have B cell, and on its surface, it has a whole bunch of antibodies. But these antibodies are stuck in the membrane, they're not going anywhere. Does that make sense? Each clone of B cells has its own type of antibody, which has its own specificity. So in our example, clone one can recognize that particular antigen. Just this one, not anything else, just this one. And clone two cannot. Now, okay, to kind of, imagine we have another antigen, and it has this determinant. Will clone two recognize it? Yeah. Will clone one? No. Each clone has its own unique specificity. Does that make sense? FC. I'm trying to think. Okay. No, I can't do that. Imagine that I am a B cell and my arm is B cell receptor. So this will be FC fragment and this will be the prongs that I'm binding to them. Better? Ooh, okay, awesome. So, a clonal, clonal selection, what happens next? Proliferation and differentiation. So, proliferation. Cells divide. That makes it simple. They just divide. Now, I, I'm, I'm checking conceptual understanding. We just selected clone one, correct? So these B cells start to divide massively. Do these B cells divide? No. Only one clone, okay? And this is this proliferation often referred to as clonal expansion. Does that make sense? So, differentiation. What, differentiation is becoming more specialized, right? So, what do they specialize into? Uh, I'll focus on two main types it's plasma cells and memory cells. Okay. So what do plasma cells do? Plasma cells produce antibodies. Okay.
the, the best way to kind of um, best analogy for this is something in the line of community, a war. When you have a specific type of invasion, your immune system, adaptive immune system, is capable to recognize that particular type of invasion and produce a very tailored response to that invasion. Produce antibodies that will be specific only against the response. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So antigen is form Okay. So when you are getting a flu shot, the the inactivated flu virus that is in the vaccine is an antigen. Your B cells produce antibody that to that flu shot, to that antigen that will recognize it. Does that make sense? Better? Okay. Huh? Hold on, hold on. You, great question, you a little bit ahead. We get that. We get in there just like a couple minutes, okay? That's, that's a fantastic question. At this point, what I want you to understand, we don't have a lot of this deep stuff. We don't need that. We kind of think of it this way. 10 is enough. Like, if we have 10, it's okay. Because once these cells are selected, what are they going to do? They're going to grow to absolutely massive amounts. They're going to produce a shit ton of antibodies. And they're going to generate some memory B cell. Does that make sense? So, I'm going to that thought about the mechanism because I want to address some other issues. First, when you kind of recover an infection is done, what happens to those plasma cells? They die. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Memory B cells to grow. They're going to sit in your, mostly in your bone marrow and lymphoid organs. Which, you know, going back. Second thing, what do you need to know about antibodies? So I'm not going to put five different types on the board, you have a table in the lecture notes. What do you need to know? Main mechanism, I'll list them. Whether or not they can be transferred uh, via placenta, whether or not they can activate them. So, complement. Uh, this one. So, um, immunoglobulin E, IgE, allergy. IgD, IgD is a B cell receptor. IgA is dimeric antibody, which is responsible for mucosal immunity. Your, your oral cavity, your throat, your trachea, um, reproductive mucosa, digestive mucosa. This is where you have immunoglobulin A, IgA. Also, this is the antibody that was transferred from mother to child by the rest. IgM is a massive first response antibody. It's dampener, five molecules together. The first response. IgM can activate complement, okay, here, like classic complement. So we can find a row. I'm going to put a little tiny IgM. And another type, IgG. IgG is most common, and IgG can transfer across the center. It can go from mom to, to a child. Five percent. Does that make sense? There are five types. Now, to uh, Katie's question. I don't know. The bodies do not kill. They do not fight. They don't kill. They don't fight. They leave. So what you can achieve with that label, if you 
throw a bunch of antibodies on the virus. Is something going to happen to a virus? No. But it will be surrounded by antibodies and it won't be able to get into the cell. So it will become kind of easy. Does that make sense? This is why, again, you probably have heard about antibodies as a treatment for coronavirus for COVID. It makes no sense. Because by the time people get really sick, the virus is done. What are you fighting? You're trying to cure the consequences of virus infection. So you need to give antibodies to people that are about to be exposed or were recently exposed. Like uh, you, you're not even feeling crummy, you're getting tested, you test positive, you should get antibodies right away to you know nip it in this in, a, in the very beginning. Of the, of the um, so those five types. Neutralization. Antibodies can agglutinate cells. They can bind to them and clamp them together, and that makes them easier target for herbicides. They can precipitate, like toxins, when you uh, get bitten, hopefully not, by a venomous snake, and you get anti-venom, the, the serum. That serum essentially contains antibodies that will bind the, the chemical in the venom and just, just prevent it from doing anything, okay? What's important, and that is what sometimes confuses you. What is carried over something? So imagine you have a bacterial cell, and you have a bunch of antibodies that stick to it. clear? And suddenly, this bacterial cell becomes very, very noticeable and very, very attractive for your phagocytes. So not only complement can opsonize, antibodies can opsonize as well. Does that make sense? Um, so agglutination, neutralization, uh, precipitation, opsonization and phagocytosis, and of course, you know, complement population, you see what I'm saying? So antibodies, as I mentioned already, they don't kill, they don't run. All they do, they tag pathogen. Basically, they tag and say, hey, complement, get activated. Or, hey, phagocyte, get this thing eat. Okay. Or, um, well, that basically, <laughs> okay. All right? Now, I want to specifically address memory B cells. And I'm just thinking, where should I put it so it, it, it remains? Because I'm going to talk about uh, that memory response, and then we're going to take it down. Okay. I'm going to put a little graph here. And if you can't see, you can come closer and check it out. Nothing, nothing complicated. So I'm going to graph the primary and secondary response. And we're going to start with an infection. So imagine there, the infection happens here. So that's the initial infection. Look at the left point. Okay? And this green and blue will reflect two, antibodies, two different types of antibodies. So first of all, for like 7 to 14 days, nothing's going to happen. You're not going to have any antibodies. Because what? These cells have to recognize the antigen. Does that make sense? You have to go through clonal selection. You have to go through clonal expansion and differentiation of these cells. And only when you have enough plasma cells, the antibody levels will start to rise. The first one will be the immunoglobulin M, and then it will decline, so it's IgM. This is why we call it a first response. And then, IgG. Now, please understand, this is not up to scale. I want to show you. So, you've heard about antibody tests for COVID. When you, first of all, it's a blood test. It's not a measles. This is where antibodies come in the blood. 
We're good. So if you get tested and they find IgM or both IgG and IgM, it means that you were infected very recently. And it's very possible that you have active infection right now. If you get tested and all they find is IgG, it means that you were infected, recovered, you have antibodies. Now, what happens when you get infected second time? And it, it does happen. When you get infected second time, IgMs first, and here's your second infection right here. Now, it's not going to take seven days. IgM going to go up and down, and look at the IgG response. It's going to skyrocket almost immediately. Does that make sense? So secondary response is faster, and it's more robust. How we put it? That's that's kind of. This is why. Vaccines. That's our response to vaccine. That's our response to secondary response. Huh? Basin, yes. Your immune system remembers. And you may have seen in, in media a lot of publications saying, oh, you know, antibodies, they do not last. You know, should they last? The question is not so much do antibodies last. The question is, do you have memory B cells? And if you do, then once you get, for instance, you recover from COVID, you feel fine, five months later, you get exposed again. Are you going to get infected? Are you going to get sick? Probably not, because your memory B cells will mount a response that will shut down the infection in, in, in its you know, beginning. Does that make sense? The bone marrow and lymphoid tissue. Yes, yes, yes. So, like memory B cells, they go back to where they came from. Right? This? Yeah, because you already have B cells. Yeah. So, for instance, if you were vaccinated, a great example is polio. You all got vaccine against polio, it's injected in vaccine. You produce a robust antibody response. If you go, if you get exposed, if you get polio in your mouth and your guts, can you have an act of infection? Yes. Will you get sick? No, because your memory B cell will just produce the response that it will do. To be honest, in polio also, the antibody diet was lost for years. And we get so many boosters that polio vaccine is unusual. It should be. <laughs> okay? That makes sense. Now, last thing before going, I, I describe it in the notes. You must know the difference between passive and active immunity. Natural and acquired. Natural and acquired or artificial, wait, natural or artificial, super simple. Artificial is something that results because of food. That makes sense. So infection is natural, vaccine is artificial. Now, and I'm going to give you some examples. Now, what's the difference between passive and active? If you expose your immune system, an antigen, it's active. If you simply take antibodies in the plasma and you transfer those antibodies to another person, that's passive. Am I clear? And I'm going to do a finishing part. So when you, let's do coronavirus, sure. When you, no, it's just, it's a great example. When you get infected, like infected with coronavirus, is your immune system exposed? Yes. Is that an act of nature? Yes. So it's natural active immunity. When you get a vaccine 
against coronavirus. Is your immune system exposed to an antigen? Yes, you get the vaccine. But is it an act of nature? No, it's an act of human. So it's active, artificial immune. Okay? When you are the 45th president of the United States and you get antibodies, and you get exposed to COVID and you get antibodies, like in the plasma or those artificial monoclonal antibodies from the general. Those antibodies are passively transferred, okay? That's passive immunity, okay? And it's artificial because humans do it. If you, a newborn, and your mom had COVID, and she breastfeeds you, and you get anti-COVID antibodies to breast milk, is that neutral? Yes. Your system isn't getting exposed to it, so it's natural passive. Basically, breastfeeding or transplacental immunity is natural passive. Uh, plasma transfusion is artificial passive. Vaccine, artificial active. Infection, natural active. So, know those examples. They they good. Make sense? Let's do both. Come back with about T cell responses. Really good. Thank you. 
Oh, okay. Well, I'm not going to. I'm not going to. There's going to be a huge break in this meeting. We'll record it. Yeah. Stop.
So I'm going to talk about uh, my least favorite concept to explain in adaptive immunity. And we're going to chat briefly about T cell response, and the concept of selection of the brain and So my least favorite concept to discuss is the major physical utility complex. So um, I I despise that I, like not not the idea of major physical utility complex, but the explanation of it I hate. That's a long one. Okay. Oh, look, major, that's a good one. Histo compatibility. Tissue compatible. Complex. So what what is it? There are two types of M these, these are molecules. Am I clear? MHC are molecules. These molecules are found on all nucleated cells in a human body. So, in, you know, the cells that you cannot find those molecules are uh, red blood cells, platelets, sperm cells. Okay? Now, look what happens. Check it out. So we've got MHC plus one with a color program. We've got MHC type one, which is found on all nucleated cells. No exceptions. And then you've got MHC class two, Which is found on antigen presenting cells. Which are nuclear cells, B cells, Marvel. Now listen, listen. I told you that when I see class one. Is found uh, on the cell, right? It's correct. That's right. And I told you that uh, not non nucleated cells are red blood cells, platelets, and stem cells. You follow me so far? So, based on these two statements, my first question the dritic cells, for instance, are they nucleated? Do they have nucleus? Yeah. B cells. Matrophages. If they are nucleated, do they have MHC plus one? I told you. They do. Yeah. <laughs> so these three cell types have both MHC1 and MHC. Does that make sense? So these have class one and class two. Other cells? Nucleated cells only class one. Are we clear? That makes sense. What is the function of MHC molecules? I'll explain it very simple on camera and for you. Look, if I am a normal cell, my MHC molecule, which is my hand, my arm, will stick out an antigen, a self antigen, a fragment of me showing to the rest of the immune system. I'm good. I'm healthy. I'm self. Okay? If I am not self, like if I'm infected, or if I am cancerous, or if I am coming from a different body, I will speak out in a different body, saying, hey, that is, you know, me, but I don't match your standards. Does that make sense? So this is what MHC shows. Major, he's the compatibility. 
all your tissues, all your like all my tissues will be quote unquote green. Okay, all tissues of leaves will be quote unquote brown. Does that make sense? Is brown normal for her? Yes. Is it normal for me? No. We're going to come back to it in, in transplantation. So far, we good? Okay. Now, let's move on to T cells. So, what happens in T cell responses? That's important for T cell responses. Cell responses. <coughs> so, T cells. So, originally in the bone marrow. Then they move into the thymus, where they mature. And then they move to a seed with fluid organs. Okay, so comparing them to B cells, remember we said, you know, born in Cleveland, go to Cleveland State. Born in Cleveland, go to Columbus State University. Makes sense, right? And then, just like B cells, T cells end up in the lymphoid tissue, like spleen. Lymphoid. Good? Now, how do they get back to that? Here it becomes a little not tricky, but I raised the picture of B cell activation. But conceptually, B cells can directly recognize an antigen. Do I make sense? Remember, B cell and antigen they can directly recognize. B cells cannot do that. So what happens? So T cells, when they mature, they form two populations of cells: CD4 and CD8. CD4 and CD8 are names for different surface molecules, so called clusters of differentiation. Now, these two distinct populations of T cells have different functions and they get activated here. The CD4 T cells, oh, okay, T cells have to have an antigen being presented to them. Let me explain. Let's Imagine that the leaves, or the least in Katie and Amanda, you all are T cells. Okay? So I am antigen presenting cell, right? So what I do, I show it to the leaves. Oh, actually, we're going to do role play. You don't have to do anything. I'm just going to call you up, okay? You don't have to do anything. So I'm going to play a role of dendritic cell. Um, the lease is going to be CD4, okay? Amanda's going to be, and Katie, you're going to be CD8. Okay. So, what I do, I show the lease this marker, and I tell them this is the antigen, this is the band. And she gets activated as a CD4 T cell, she becomes an effective cell. Okay. So CD4 cell gets presentation of MHC plus two. So my right hand here, my right hand, is MHC plus two one. Because Liz can only recognize MHC plus two. Does that make sense? And then I'm showing the same antigen to K on a different hand. I'm dendritic cell, I have both. So this is MHC plus one. She's CD8 cell, okay? So she gets presented the antigen. By MHC plus one. Does that make sense to you? This is called uh, MHC restriction. CD8 cells, CD8 cells, they recognize only class 1. CD4 cells recognize class 1. 
Yes, CD4 T cells recognize antigen presented from MHC plasma. CD8 T cells recognize an antigen presented from MHC plasma. My mnemonic rule it's always 8. 8 multiplied by 1 equals 3. 4 multiplied by 2 equals 8. So, what these cells become? CD4 cells can become T helper, T regulatory, and CD4 memory cells. Does that make sense? Now, CD8 T cells can become cytotoxic. Lymphocytes or CTLs. Or they can become memory T cells. Memory T cells. Does that make sense? Now the most important part here is what what can T helper cells do and what side effects of lymphocytes do? So T helper cells can look. They can increase B cell activation. They can increase macrophage activation. And they also help to activate CD4 cells. Actually, I'm going to reassign the ones to them. So please, you still see the four. Okay. Does that make sense? 80 will be CD8. And Amanda is going to be inside. And I am A will be inside. Now let's go to this marker once again. So first, look, I present the antigen. To the CD4 cell, right? Now. Is that understood? So, release the CD4 cell differentiates and proliferates into T helper cell. Make sense? Very specific to helper cell that is driven to recognize this end. Okay? What she can do? She can stimulate macrophages and she can help Amanda, who is B cell, to more efficiently mount the response to this antigen. Why? Because CD4 recognizes MHC class 2, right? And Amanda's B cell has MHC class 2. So they can communicate. Does it make sense? Another function that police can pick up is to help Katie, who is CD8 cell, to become cytotoxic against this antigen. Does that make sense? I always compare T helpers to a football player. Do they feel anything? They don't. Like the football coach doesn't play on the field. But look what they did. T helper cells help B cells to produce antibodies more efficiently. They help macrophages to become more active. They stimulate basically phagocytic activity. Does that make sense? And they help CD8 cells to become efficient cytotoxic cells. Am I clear? Does that make sense? Now, there is a disease in which CD4 cells get wiped out. It's called HIV. So look at that. If you wipe out CD4 cells, you have no T helpers. You have no T helpers. Your B cell response sucks. Your macrophage response sucks. Your cytotoxic response sucks. 
Raymond's sister basically is like that. Does that make sense? Now, if we covered the tea house was really well. I'm not going to talk about commandments, so that's going to be a in the last minute. What is T regulatory cell? T regulatory cell dampens your immune response. Because you need to kind of, at some point, slow it down, right? Now, if your immune response keeps going on and on and on, you're going to have an autoimmune condition. Am I clear? And it will show that the autoimmune conditions such as response to virus, inflammatory bowel disease, there is a deficiency in the T regulatory cell. There's not a lot of them, and they're not so bad. Does that make sense? Okay, so those are things that you need to know. That's the stuff that I can. When you, if you look at the lecture notes that are TH1, TH2, TH17, yeah. Just generally T help it. Increase B cell activation, increase macrophage activation. Side Good. How do this work? Side effects. So if we use that football analogy, that's the point. Okay. Let's say quarterback. Can't throw well without you know from the coach. That's I don't know your linebackers and that's your running back. Offensive line running. Okay. They all need some kind of coordination. Can they play without a coach? Well, that's going to suck. Okay, their performance is going to be poor. I would play. That is uh, how cytotoxic lymphocytes work. Two mechanisms, I talk about them in the notes. It's either recognition of a ligand. So imagine that I am a cytotoxic lymphocyte and this is an infected cell. Okay. I have a ligand, a ligand, she has a receptor, so we kind of shake hands and she dies. Make sense? That's so cytotoxic lymphocytes can trigger apoptosis via the receptor ligand nuclei. Make sense? Another option, and I'm gonna reverse the ones. I'm an infected cell. Uh, releases cytotoxic lymphocyte. So what she does, she releases special proteins called perforins. And perforins poke holes in me. And then she releases another set of proteins called granzymes. Granzymes get into me from those holes and kill me by apoptosis. In both cases, cytotoxic lymphocytes induce apoptosis. They don't do phagocytosis, they do not produce antibodies, they're not phagocytic, they do apoptosis. And last week we were talking about NK cells, same story, same mechanism. NK cells and CD8 cytotoxic lymphocytes do apoptosis. My opinion. Okay. I'm going to highlight some roots. Remember, we're talking about B cells and antibodies, how antibodies can increase phagocytosis and stimulate activate properly. That's the link between humoral B cell response and innate response. Here, look, T helper cells activate B cell. That's the link between cellular T cell response and B cell response. The helpers increase macrophage activity, a link between cellular response and innate immunity. Does that make sense? So it's all very interconnected. That's what I'm trying to say. Got it? Last thing about um, T and B cells, and we're going to move on to uh, immune pathologies quickly. Selection. So, what does that mean? So, there are two questions, quote unquote questions, that T cells are being asked during maturation. 
The first question is, recognizes MHC? Just in general, can a T cell recognize MHC? If answer is yes, so if answer is yes, the next question is asked. Now, what does that mean? Recognize yourself and does your T cell get activated, triggered by self antigen? Does it attack your own tissue? So if the answer is no, then this T cell is okay. Does it make sense? We good? So look. What if answer to the first question recognizes MHC is no? Do you need a T cell that cannot recognize MHC? Look at this for job. Do you need it? It's useless. It's not going to get activated. Does that make sense? It's going to be an urgent. So what you're going to do with this? Have a test. Now, let's say you have T cell that can recognize MHC, but it's going to attack your own tissues. Do you need that? Are we clear here? So, this part right here, full deposit selection. This part right here is for negative selection. Good. So T cells go to positive first, so they fail. Now, if the cell fails, if, if, if positive selection fails, the T cells are not going to work. If negative selection fails, the T cells are going to work. They're going to attack their own tissues. Are we clear? T cells, in general, go mostly in the negative selection. They're getting tested for because they don't really, they're not that so important for MHC, okay? They go to the selection. So B cells are selected for not attacking the MHC. My goal. Now, <clears throat> they're very, very bad. So remember when we're using this as a prop for an antigen that you, T cells, have to learn about. Okay? So KT was CD8, cytotoxic Okay, So KT got trained to do one. She will go into the circulation and will kill all cells that have this sign on them. Does that make sense? Now, this, this is normal. This means that I'm infected with some virus. Right? Will you kill this cell? Like, I have this sign on me. I'm a cell. I have this sign. You want to kill me? Yes, please. I'm normal. You want to kill me? I'm infected with a different virus. You want to kill me? No, because she doesn't know, right? She doesn't know that this is bad. She was trained only for this one time. That's important to understand. We're not like blind. Good. So that's finally. I mean, MHC concept is awesome, but explaining it, pain in the ass. Any question? Okay. I'm going to fairly quickly 
Would you need a pathologist or medical on it? I'm going to put it in immunodeficiency. No, sorry, immunopathology. The first is hypersensitivity. There are four types of hypersensitivities. I'm going to be relatively brief about them. Type one is the allergy. Now, I have a pretty good illustration in the lecture notes. Okay. If you don't mind, since it's all being recorded anyway. So here's how your allergy is formed. You get exposed to an allergy. Is that like you are? Let me let me explain it using myself as an example. Okay. I am let's say 12 years old, okay, and I interact with a cat. My immune system gets exposed to some point, I believe in the cat's. Saliva. Good? There's protein in the cat's saliva. My immune system forms an immune response against it. It shouldn't, because it does. Okay? And that immune response, very specifically, involves immunoglobulin P. Um, IgE is formed. Okay? It binds to The mast cell. And at this point, nothing happens. Then I interact with the same cat again, so second exposure. The antigen, the antigen from the saliva, binds to immunoglobulin E, which sits on the mast cells and causes degranulation of mast cells. Degranulation. Mast cells release odors and chemical cytokines, and you have allergies. Does that make sense? Anyone has? Anyone? Okay. So, basically, allergy is when the immune system does it. How can you? I have a question. How can you grow out of the allergy? You have that population of B cells. It generates an immunoglobulin P against iron and mineral, you get it exhausted. It doesn't exist anymore. You grow up, that population of B cells is gone. Does that make sense? Right clear. Um, now, I'm allergic to pets. I am. Can, can I cure this out? Probably yes. In a very simple manner, if we will get a cat, I will be exposed to so much antigen from cats that it will completely exhaust my B cell response. My immune system eventually will learn that you know it is not an allergen, it's fine. You sh we should, I should not mount any response. To it. It's called immune tolerance, it's totally fine. Uh, basically, many allergies are treated like this, just not by immediate exposure to massive amount of allergen, but by small doses. Uh, there was an experiment when kids with peanut allergies were given tiny small amounts of peanut allergen, and they eventually got that. Not completely cured the problem. Make sense? Go ahead. Uh -huh. Now it's what? I can only tell what tell you why it got better because your immune system basically you were getting allergy shots and your immune system mounted some problem. Now maybe um, the presentation of antigen change. So there might be, you may need some different formulations, different shots. It's possible. Our understanding, why we have allergies, is very important. Okay. 
my my symptoms here. I have similar problems. It's not bad, not too bad. That makes sense. Type two. Um, that's blood groups. So we we count. Those are red blood cells. Okay. So this is type O. This is A, this is B, this is A, B. What do what does that mean? Look. On the surface of your red blood cells, you have agglutinogens, antigens. Does that make sense? On the cell. In the plasma in the blood. You have antibodies called agglutinins. So in type O, you have an type A and an type B. Here you have only an type B, only an type A, and one. You clear? So you see they are mutually exclusive because look what happens if you transfer blood with a A type into someone with a B type. In the plasma of the recipient, you have anti-A antibody. Does that make sense? They will bind to that surface antigen and they will clump the cells together. And it will be hemolysis, they will get obstruction of blood vessels, and so forth. No fusion reaction. Does that make sense? You you may, some of you may have a valid question. Why do we discount this? If we transfuse A into B, why do we care only about these red blood cells and this blood? Generally speaking, volume wise, when you transfuse, you focus on red blood cells. Does that make sense? So you need to kind of look at the red blood cells from the donor and the plasma from the recipient. My clue. So, what is the best blood group to be transfused? What's the universal donor? Oh, they have no antigen. Does that make sense? Yet no. Not yet. So, best donor is blood type O. Now, look which blood doesn't have any antibody. It's AB. This plasma has no antibody. Does that make sense? A, B is the universal we see. Do you know your blood? Do you know your blood? Type? No? So, okay. so, yeah, we get to plasma. Right? So far, O. So, universal donor, universal donor. Turns out we're not so universal. Does that make sense? So, that's your A, B blood types. So you need to be able to tell me, like, What's the universal donor? What's the universal receiver? What's going to happen? Can you, like, these folks, like you and I, what can we get? We can only receive blood type O. Okay? People with A can receive A and O. People with B can receive B and O. And people with A, B can. Okay? People with A, B, any blood type. Now, positive versus, what does that mean, positive or negative? So this talks about a completely separate set of antigens. It's D or rhesus factor. We do not have pre-existing antibodies to it, am I clear? So this is O positive. I am O positive. Do you know your blood type? Okay. Let's say, let's say, just for the sake of you know conversation, um, Katie is O negative. Okay. And Amanda is A B negative. Okay. So here's the story. If 
We are O positive. This is our red blood cell. Okay. If KD is O negative, this is her red blood cell. You don't have any antibody. You don't. If Amanda is AB negative, this is your red blood cell. Now, what if we will transfuse Katie's blood into me? Katie's blood here into me. There is no D antigen. It's totally fine. My immune system is totally fine. D uh, O negative is truly universal blood. What if we do the other way around and transfuse my blood, O positive blood, into Katie? Does she have D antigen? No, she doesn't. So her immune system will make antibodies against the antigen. She's in good. So people with O negative blood type are screwed because they can only get O negative. You and I, we can get O positive and O negative. Both are fun. Now, Amanda, can you receive this blood? Absolutely. Should you receive this one? Probably not a great idea because your immune system will produce antibodies in the end. Does that make sense? Now that plays into what we call a rhesus conflict. Um, so when mother is so this is this. This is mom. Okay. So mom's negative. Fetus is positive. I follow. And there's when its fetus is separated by the placenta. There is no blood exchange. There's no contact between the blood. So everything's cool. That's the first way. Baby is born during the delivery. The center detaches. And for a short period of time, Fetal blood gets into mom. So far we did. So the fetal blood gets into mom. Does mom mount the immune response? Yes, she does. So she forms an ID antibody. Then, in sense, second pregnancy. Same mom. Mom is negative. Okay. Now she has antibodies. Fetus and mom are separated by placenta, but it's not rainbows and unicorns because this will cause placenta to bind to bind to fetal red blood cells and cause what's called the reproblastosis fetalis or hemolytic disease of numerals, which is pretty bad. Okay. Hmm? Getting there. Okay. Does that make sense? So it like first baby is fun, second baby not so much, and it's really not great condition. So what can you do? We prevent this shit show from happening. What you do is you give mom artificial antibodies against the antigen. So we, we are back to our um, first baby. Okay, it's the first, first baby, first fetus. It's not a baby, but it's fetus. Okay. Mother receives artificial and IV antibodies. These ones, since they're artificial, they can't cross placenta. Make sense? So they stay in mom. During birth, placenta is not. Baby's gone as well, so it's totally fine. But these antibodies will immediately jump onto fetal red blood cells, and they will mask them from mom's immune response. Does that make sense? Understood? It's like the masking part is what people often get confused about. It's not just to destroy those red blood cells, it's basically to hide them. If they are covered by artificial antibodies, mom's immune response is not going to go. 
That's actually pretty cool. A uh, good analogy to this can be, there was a scientific discussion if if, if, if Trump has his own antibodies to coronavirus. It is a new. And paradoxically, the answer is most likely no. Because when he got infected, remember, he got antibodies, artificial. So those artificial antibodies, they bound to the virus, but they essentially uh, screened the virus away from his own immune system. So his immune system didn't see the virus because it was already bound by antibodies. Does that make sense? Same idea. Good? Now, the last couple of types of um, hypersensitivity. Type 3, just like type 2, it's mediated by IgG, immunoglobulin G. Type 3 is a truly autoimmune disease. So I'm not going to put pictures of them because I cited it. I'm going to explain more. Imagine that your immune system produces antibodies against neural tissues. Mostly those antibodies target antigens that are located in the basal membrane of the disease. So you've got a whole bunch of antibodies that are binding to your basement member in every year. Do antibodies do anything? Do they kill? Do they lie? Antibodies per se? No, they don't do it. What they do, they attract phagocytes, neutrophils and macrophages. Am I clear? Neutrophils and macrophages start attacking basement membrane in your epithelium, destroy it. And your epithelium becomes so basically you have a whole bunch of neutrophils and macrophages in the epithelium and they cause inflammation. If that's skin we're talking about, that's psoriasis. If that's heart we're talking about, heart it um, and uh, we have endocarditis. If it's uh, synovial membrane joints we're talking about, we have arthritis. If it's blood vessels, we have vasculitis. If it's kidney, we have glomerular infection. What I just described are a bunch of symptoms of lupus. Okay? Does that make sense? Your antibodies, your own antibodies against your own tissues, attract your own phagocytic cells to attack your own energy. And you have inflammation. Does that make sense? Okay. But, uh, so how it works you walk in a park and in front of a eye the first time you go out you don't give a moment in front of it you touch to it components of that oil from poison ivy get in uh, they get into your skin and your dendritic cells present, they shouldn't, but they do present this antigen to your T cells. That make sense? And you form a pretty strong CD4 response. Now, CD4 is a helper response, right? You're not bad. You keep walking. You walk in the park next day, well, not next day, two months later, and you encounter poison ivy this time you have memory cells cd4 cells that immediately proliferate and stimulate macrophages and cytotoxic lymphocytes to get rid of the poison ivy oil and cytotoxic lymphocytes and macrophages start destroying cells that have poison ivy oil on them. What you have, you have those blisters. Does that make sense? So your immune system tries to get rid of something that it should. Same story with the TB test. When your TB test comes positive, that means that your immune system, your T cell response, it was formed at some point because you were exposed to direct Does that make sense? And the bigger the blister, the more likely 
you are to have it right now. Yes. Go ahead, go ahead. In this case. Yes. The amount of um, yeah, just not enough. Because here's the thing: you have to be exposed to infection to to microorganism right? and have systemic disease in order to test positive. But if you take this little tiny shot in the skin, it's not enough to activate your entire immune system if you are naive. Does that make sense? So basically, if you were exposed to TB but didn't have an infection, you're not going to get any response. And this is why I said, for instance, the bigger the blister, the more likely you have to uh, to have, likely you are to have an activity. Does that make sense? So those are four types of hypersensitivity. Um, we actually have just a couple more things. One is transplantation, which um, the grafts, um, four types, auto, iso, allo, xeno. Autogram, your own tissues. You get a burn, the skin is transplanted from your blood onto the bone. Does that make sense? Isograft, graft between identical twins. Okay? It's a great way to get, if you basically, what I'm saying, if you have an identical twin, um, lure them into your house, put them in the basement, chain them to some, you know, Chain them in the basement, keep them well, that's going to be the source of all the The best source of all the identity. Okay? You don't do it there with you. Uh, no rejection. Between identical twins, no rejection. Allogram. Anything between humans except identical twins. So it doesn't matter if it's the graph of a complete stranger or, or your own mother. It's still an allogram. Does that make sense? Xenograft from animals, we do transplant uh, cardiac valves, for instance. We can take them from a pig. It's pretty well formed. clear? Now, two problems with grafts. Rejection and graft versus post diseases. So what's the rejection? In rejection, T cells on the sequence never write the recipient. The recipient, they kill the graph. Does that make sense? So imagine that I am getting a new leaf. Okay. This is my layer. This is what my cells do. I'm blue, okay? And this is what liver daughter carries green, right? So when my immune system, which is used to this, sees this, it goes batshit crazy and starts to destroy the liver. Does that make sense? And that's all about MHC. That's because we have different that's tissue compatibility. Now, what is graft versus host disease? Or GH graft versus host disease. In this case, T cells of transplanted bone marrow kill the sequence. Uh, this, this is me, all my tissues. Does that make sense? Let's say 
I get bone marrow transplant. So my bone marrow gets completely eliminated. Are we clear? I have no immunity. And this is the bone marrow that's being placed in me. So this bone marrow starts to produce new T cells. T cells of the transplanted bone marrow are used to breed. And what they see around them, blue. Does that make sense? So for transplant, the entire body is alien, is formed, and it starts to destroy all the tissue. It's called graft versus post disease. How we fight it? We miss it. We're good. Um, and finally, immune deficiencies. Immune deficiencies acquired and congenital. Now, acquired immune deficiencies that you are not born with, like you can develop cancer, you can acquire HIV, that's all you need, acquired immune deficiencies. Now, congenital immune deficiencies are the ones that people born with, okay? Um, usually in the community, if there is a deficiency in the community, uh, they usually bring the one to the so there's not one. So I want you to know three congenital immune deficiencies, that's it. No B cells. Right, which is um, sort of brain fart called a gamma globulinity. No mean one, right? no B cell. I mean, a dysfunction. No T cells, no cellular response. This is called the George syndrome. Are you with me? And the most severe of them all is one of the one two. And it's called severe combined immune deficiency for the bubble or the planet stuff. That's bad. That makes sense? So the George Obama pneumonia, severe combined immune deficiency. If all of them are congenital people are born. So far we good. Now, if we do the things about the entire system, just things that you should know. There's not much. First of all, this exam should be have next week. There's no um, no anatomy for that. No. Okay. Second thing. So no massive, no parts of the immune system, the progression of vessels, uh, lymphatic capillaries, lymphatic vessels, lymphatic trunks, lymphatic ducts, that kind of stuff. Order. Know that uh, lymph is returning back in the blood at the juncture. It means subclavian and tubal veins on both sides. Trying to think what else. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you a few questions about the structure of the leaf node. So, things to know there is cortex, the algorithm, and the dual, the female. Are you with me, sir? So you have mostly B cells and dendritic cells in the dual and B cells and T cells, no, B cells and dendritic cells in the cortex, and B cells and T cells and macrophages in the middle. Probably the kind of more 
most important physiological feature, if you would look at this image, picture of the original, it will show you that there are many A parent vessels that bring it into the room. And there are just one or two E parent vessels that drain it. Why? So when you have a lot of things coming in and just you flowing out, you have a traffic jam in the leaf. Does that make sense? So leaf stays static, which allows for more interaction, more recognition by, by BMT cells. So lymphatic really, it's a super small. Any questions? That will conclude this topic.